So I'd like to introduce Yue Xiao Chen, and he was originally environmental engineering, but he's completed his PhD in chemical engineering at Penn State with Dr. Kumar, right? Mm -hmm. And then he is currently doing a postdoc with Kumar mm -hmm. and Enrique Gomez, and he will be going to UC Berkeley mm -hmm. the following year for another postdoc. Mm -hmm. And with that, let's welcome him. Okay. Okay, so first I'd like to thank uh, this uh, DYSS uh, committee like choosing me and I'm very excited to give my talk here. So my topic is energy efficient water purification from biological channels to bio-inspired artificial channels. So our group, membrane, uh, biomimetic membrane research group, so basically we uh, borrow ideas from biology and uh, using biological elements to make devices that uh, utilize the transport properties of these transport membrane proteins. So before going through my research, I'd like to talk about myself. So I grew up in Shanghai, the more very modernized city. Then I moved to Beijing for my, uh, for my master and undergrad research. Uh, where it has air pollution, like, like these days. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's different from uh, here. So then I moved uh, from China to uh, the, the middle of Pens uh, Pennsylvania State for my PhD studies. I was very shocked there's no tall building at Penn State, so I talked to someone. So I had to find something to do. It's, it's very country style life. So I, during the leisure hours, I do photographies. So these are the beautiful images I took near Penn State area. So now I talk about my research. So during the master period, I studied environmental engineering, wastewater treatment. Uh, basically, this is the topic I choose, membrane fouling of membrane bioreactors for wastewater treatment. This is typically what we do. We fed the wastewater into a, a tank where a microorganism grows, and this microorganism will consume uh, the, all the components in the wastewater and then transfer to carbon dioxide and water and the biomass. And after the process, we put a membrane module inside the, 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 the membrane tank and then separated the treated wastewater from biomass. So this is the typical place I work with. I work in these wastewater treatment plants, right? And then before we run the plant, we install the membrane module. The membrane module looks like this. It's fresh, new. But then after we run this plant for several months, we take the membrane out. Ah, you, you feel this is the membrane. So you, you see the bio falling, everything is clogged. They have inorganic falling, the flux decline, the pressure greatly increased. So I want to ask ourselves, I did some basic research, but I always want to ask myself, can we boost our membrane performance so we can save more energy, right? and get more like water. So that's why I came to Penn State. So at Penn State, I did uh, I switched a field from environmental engineering to chemical engineering. So my PhD journey was totally different from my uh, master's. I learned biology, and I also learned synthetic chemistry. I combined these two fields to make like biomimetic channels that mimic the uh, biological cell membranes. So the first the project I work on is development of artificial water channel based membrane for desalination, right? So these channels mimic the transport properties of biological water channels. I'm also interested in other channels such as artificial proton channels. So this is another channel I characterized during my PhDs. It specifically can transport protons. So I'm also interested in how to develop these channel based material into real separation materials. I I incorporate them into lipids or in block polymer membranes and I try to make devices. And finally, my lab is also interested in other transport, uh, transport uh, based um, membrane proteins, such as uh, this uh, light driven ion transport membrane protein, heterodopsins. But today, because of the, the time limitations, I'm going to only talk about one of the most exciting projects I work so far is artificial water channel based uh, the membrane for desalination. So as a poster now, I switch back from biology because I learned a lot from biological membrane. I switch back to polymer membrane because polymer membrane, reverse osmosis membrane, are still 
the most, uh, I mean, common membrane we used uh, for uh, desalination plant, right? So if we talk about the reverse osmosis membrane, if you don't have a background, I can introduce a little bit. It's basically made of three layers. It's made of one very dense polyimide uh, layer. It's a separating layer, separating water from salt. It, uh, it is uh, interfacial polymerized on the polysiphon support, then casted on the polyester fabric. So this membrane is pre predominantly used in the market, especially for Dow company, right, other companies. And if we take a close look at this magic polyimide layer, this is the cross-section TEM image. This is the polysiphon. This is the polyimide. It's very, very heterogeneous. So you can see the nodules standing out right, from this area to this area. But the information provided by this uh, cross-section TEM is limited. So we want to know the real 3D structures. So during the postdoc now, I learned the electron tomography. So I, if this is the videos, I, 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 after I did the reconstruction, basically we delaminate this film and then put it on the TEM grid and then tilt it in the TEM in from 90, uh, 70 degrees to minus 70 degrees. And then we get a different image section and then we use different organism to 3D constructor. This is the 3D image, uh, 3D models I constructed. So basically, I want to reconstruct the 3D models of this membrane and then study the, what's the intrinsic pore, pore structure and then related to the transport uh, properties. So this is the exciting project I've done so far. So if you summarize all the projects I have done, there are two common elements. One is water, one is membrane. Why interesting water? Because water is the, one of the biggest the challenges in this century, right? One part is the drinking water, such as the, the recent Flink drinking water issues, right? The lead uh, leaks out by the, uh, by the pipeline and uh, enter the drinking water system. And also about uh, industrial waste waters. For example, the oil and the gas industry. So this industry, they consume millions of gallons of water per day they use this water to, for hydraulic fracking. And 90% of this produced wastewater are not well treated and directly inject into the wells that probably cause earthquake in Oklahoma and probably in California. Right? And why are interested in membrane technologies? Because membrane technologies can uh, treat this contaminated wastewater and the uh, uh, contaminated drinking water and the wastewater very well. But if you look at the energy cost, for example, in California region, right, they use the uh, desalination-based technologies to treat uh, seawater. The energy cost is much higher than convention conventional uh, uh, water treatment technologies. So in wastewater treatment, if you combine the membrane-based technologies, the energy cost is so high. So I always ask ourselves, can we design a membrane with better permeability, selectivity, and like anti-fouling resistance? Right, so today, I'm going to address the, like, the first two, two, two things, the permeability and the selectivity. Can we boost our membrane with higher performance, higher permeability, and higher selectivity? So if we want to boost the membrane performance, we can learn from nature. Because nature has evolved for a billion years to enhance the transport across the cell membrane. Right? So for example, we have a, a like membrane protein they call pump they can actively transport solutes against the uh, co solute concentration across the cell membrane using energy such as ATP or even light, right? So other small molecules, they are not membrane proteins, they're ionophores. They can specifically bind uh, like solutes or ions and can, they can mediate transport uh, across the bilayer by com compressing these specific ions down the concentration gradient. So other membrane protein we call channels or transporters, they can also facilitate transport, facilitate passive transport across the cell membrane down the concentration gradient. Right? If we summarize this transport, they have higher conductance and higher selectivity. For structural biologists, for scientists, they are interested because they want to know the transport mechanism. But for our engineers, right, we are interested of, uh, in, in this material because they are nature designed uh, like uh, separation materials, right? We can use it for, for uh, like sensors or even separation devices. And for me, I'm a water guy. I'm interested in water. 
So my, my research is inspired by nature. So here is one of the excellent uh, biological water filtration, filtration system, mangrove trees. So mangrove trees live uh, beside the seashore and their root system are responsible for uh, desalinating of the seawater and get fresh water. Right. Their root system cells are responsible for filtering the seawater. So what makes this process possible is by a group of biological water channel protein, aquaporins. Right. Aquaporins water channel protein, you can think about it just a pore that has very small pore size. The narrowest pore size of the aquaporins is only around three enzymes that only allow one water molecule to go through. And some amino charged acid near the restriction site will enhance the chitin rejection. So the inner wall of these, uh, these aquaporins are pretty hydrophobic, so the transport of, this, uh, of water is very fast. So aquaporin can transport almost one billion water molecules per second. So these aquaporins feature high water flux and high selectivities. Yeah, for me, it's really nature designed the desalinating filter, right? Can we use this material to make some membrane? So this is the first uh, project that I get uh, at Penn State. Yes, we can do some membrane work. This is how we design the, the project, and then this is how the membrane uh, made in the, in the literature, if you can find. Because it's a membrane protein, it will be precipitated without a specific shielding. So we had to, be, we had to uh, protect this membrane protein inside the hydrophobic environment, like in lipid bilayer or in polymer bilayer. And then we fuse these vesicles onto the support, and then we cross-link them. So we form this composite, like a membrane protein, agroporin based desalination membrane. So because we use a sphere-shaped vesicles, and we rupture them on the surface, so this membrane suffers from a coverage problem. We can never get a very good coverage of this material. So this membrane has a, a, a leakage problem. So besides, we also have other challenges of membrane proteins. So anybody got ideas? What kind of? So they have like a, at least like four answers. They're hard to make. Uh, great, that's a good idea. <laughs> Retaining the shape of the protein? Uh -huh. Proteins can change shape. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, anything else? Maybe the price? Ah, uh, also yes, price. <laughs> I think you almost got it. The first is it's long-term state Ability is not clear, right? We use proteins in the engineering applications. They will be denatured. They were eaten by microorganisms, maybe. So who knows? The second challenge is, though this protein, we, we, you saw that uh, we use this vesicle based. We use an uh, unconventional process. So we use detergent based and uh, self assemble in aqueous solution. So this is not scalable compared to uh, solvent cast based the polymer membrane. It's, it's, it's pretty fast, like within minutes, you take days to make this membrane. It's not, like, uh, it's not easy to make this membrane. So the third challenge is, yeah, it's expensive. I would tell my undergrad, be careful. Each private takes like $100, $200. The enzyme is expensive, the detergent is expensive. Uh, don't mess up. If you mess up, uh, that's fine. We'll prepare another <laughs> one, right? <laughs> so the fourth challenge is, it's more technical. If, if you design this membrane, so membrane proteins occupy too much spaces in the membrane. This sounds awkward, right? But if you, you want to design the membrane um, uh, from molecular scale, what's the sh ideal form for the membrane? So we published this paper like two years ago. So like the 2D letters, uh, Professor Binex, right? you, want to, you want to align this protein very well with the highest packing density. Probably you can put this membrane on the surface one by one, right? And uh, actually, we, we use this membrane protein 2D crystals. This is the most uh, packed protein we can find. So you align this membrane protein one by one. But if you close look at the cross-section images, the membrane protein itself is huge. It's like three by three nanometers. But the actual pore area is small. It's only 0.3 nanometers. You have a very beautiful pore that can separate the salt from water. But the actual porosity is small. That will compensate the high flux. So this is something we, we haven't expected. But when we really design the membrane, so we have these practical problems. So at this point, we have so many disadvantages. So we ask ourselves, can we make some artificial aquaporins? 
this is the challenge that I faced during my second year. So at the second year, when I wrote a review on biomimetic membranes, I suddenly find that there are some several groups in the world, they are chemists. They synthesize some artificial structure that can hold the water molecules. They call the, uh, artificial, they call the water channels. Right? And very excited, I talked to my advisor that I sh we should work on this. Right? And this is another field, we can expand it, we can overcome proteins disadvantages. And very fortunately, I can work with two of the groups in the world. One is the immediate channel they invented by Professor Mihai Babo from France. One is the, this pillar 5 arranged derivative channels uh, invented by Professor Junli Ho from Fudai University. So I'm very fortunate. I talked to my advisor. I want to learn some synthesis because I don't have that background. So I think during a winter, I take a three, a three months winter break back to China. I jump into this group and I learn how to synthesize the, these channels. I'm very happy that I don't have to listen to my advisor every day. I have a long break. <laughs> I'm glad uh, he is not here today. <laughs> you won't be happy about this. So, so after three months, of course, I work very hard, uh, right? Even in the in the in the uh, Chinese festival, spring festival, I bring this channel 2.0 version. So, what's difference uh, from the aquaporin? So, this is a one, two, three, four, five dimethoxy benzene rings, right? The pore size is very close to aquaporin pore size. It's only five angstrom. You can get it even smaller, but this this version is like five angstrom. And then we extended this. Uh, pour, uh, ring structure into a tubular structure by attaching one, two, three, four, five amino acid peptide chain on each side. So the dimension is around, the, the height is around the four nanometers. So it has similar uh, dimension as aquaporin, I mean in height, right, in height. And then we use a very hydrophobic amino acid, phenylalanine. So the surface, outer surface of this uh, uh, channel is pretty hydrophobic. So to share some similar hydrophobic autosurface compared to aquaporins. So we believe that this 2.0 version channel will have better performance in terms of water permeability right, and selectivity. So the first question I want to address is, can this artificial channel behave like aquaporin in terms of permeability and selectivity? Now this is a typical, very fundamental question. So we test our channel's performance. So not like in the traditional membrane uh, filtration because it's a molecule, it's a single molecule. So we incorporate it into like vesicles, lipid vesicles, and then we expose these vesicles into hypotonic solutions. And because of the osmotic gradient across the bilayer membrane, the water will go inside the, the vesicle, the vesicle volume will expand, the vesicle size will swell. If the vesicle swells, uh, size swells, the light scattering signal will change at certain angles. So at 90 degrees, it de decreases over time, right? It decreases, and uh, because the light scattering decrease is associated with the volume change, the volume change actually means uh, the water going through actually means the permeable, permeability, right? So we can uh, associate the, the, the kinetics of the light scattering change with the biological, uh, the, the permeabilities. So this is the typical question very, uh, we use for like a membrane protein based transport. So we incorporate our channel into vesicles. We first made a control, pure lipid vesicle. Then we add a channel into vesicles. The, lipid, the channel ratio to lipid is 1 to 200. So we find that the connection is much faster. Then we calculate the pure permeabilities. We find the, the overall contribution from, from the channel itself compared to the control. But now we know our channel can really transport the water but we don't know how many water molecules like transport through a single channel. We want to know the molecular at the molecular level, right? So how about molecular permeabilities? So we have to learn, from, learn some other method. So here is an example. So, so if we have a fluorescent particle, it, it will do a brown diffusion, right? In a small volume, what we call it confocal volume, because this is a machine, so it's specifically targeted as the confocal volume. It will diffuse like in three dimensions. And then we can collect the fluorescent signals over time. But this, but this plot is not useful. But we can transfer this fluorescence intensity over time to, and we can calculate the autocorrelation function. So what we are interested in is in the y-incept of this autocorrelation function. You can see the y-incept is directly 
inversely proportional to the fruitful number, right? The one over n, the one over c in that small chambers. So this is very useful. So based on this information, we designed this experiment. First, because our channel has carboxylic group on the, at the end, we can easily target a, a tag a fluorophore on, on, the, uh, on the channel, so become fluorescent, and then we incorporate into a vesicle. If you see, it's uh, one single fluorescent particle, but made of four channels, right? And then we test the fluorescent intensity, and we get autocorrelation auto function. We get the number of the liposome in that small volume. Then we solubilize this vesicle in a detergent solution. So now, four particle, uh, one particle uh, decomposed into four independent micelles, right, surrounded by this uh, detergent. Then we test in the fluorescent uh, microscope again, and then we get another autocorrelation function. You can see that we can calculate the number of micelles. So based on the number of micelles and divided by the number of the liposomes, we know how many channels inside the per vesicle. Uh, in this case, it's not four. I think it's 500 per vesicles. So, and based on this information plus the overall permeability, we can know the single channel permeabilities. Then we can compare our artificial channels like versus aquaporins one. Aquaporin one is one kind of aquaporins and even other aquaporin analogs such as carbon on the tube. You can see the value, right? So, this single channel permeability of this PEP5, the peptide appended the P5 ring channels, is within the range of aquaporins and uh, carbon nanotubes. And we're excited about that. So we, I answered the first question. But more, more importantly, they are more chemically stable. They are synthesized the molecule. I can put them into the organic solvent. They're still alive yeah, because I synthesize them using organic solvent. They can be dissolved in DMSO solution. They can be dissolved in chloroform. So we have potential to use them to make some polymer membrane with other polymer in the future. But the second question is pretty practical. How to pack artificial channels into membranes? So this is still the molecular transport. We want to know, make some devices, right? This is a typical question. We still learn from nature. So membrane proteins are difficult to deal with. Some people are telling me, right? And the membrane protein, because they have a hydrophobic uh, regions, uh, outside regions. This is a uh, aquaporin tetramer. You can see the red regions are hydrophobic. So they have to be shielded in a hydrophobic environment. So we use lipid bilayers. This membrane protein uh, uh, <coughs> fit comfortably inside. And then for structural biologists, they use these properties. So they mix the protein and the lipid in a detergent solution. They form lipid and the protein micelles. And then remove the detergent and they control the kinetics of the removing rate. The resulting lipid and the protein will form aggregates. And under certain conditions, proteins and the lipids will form 2D crystals. So what are 2D crystals? This is one of the, the beautiful images I will show. This is aquaporin Z uh, lipid crystal. Aquaporin Z expressed from E. coli. They form 2D crystals in lipids. They form uh, square letters, right? Not, uh, this is the protein in the lipid. Not only in lipid, proteins can also form 2D crystals in polymers. So in our lab, we also studied another membrane protein, outer membrane protein F. This is a beta barrel protein. You can see it has a pore structure. Uh, I like it because the pore size is slightly larger than aquaporins. It's a perfect pore size around 0.6 angstrom. So they can be used for another level of filtration. So this membrane protein, it, it forms tetramers. So it forms nice 2D crystals in this PBPO, polybutadiene polyethylene oxide block of polymers. So, so I'm trying to work, work on this to make this as another filtration membrane. So the, how about our channels, right? Can our channels form 2D crystals in, in, in lipid or in block of polymer membrane? So we did a simulation study. So this is uh, five to five channels in lipid membrane. And uh, this is the top view, right? And uh, after, like, if you look at the simulation, after several nanosecond simulation, you can see the pore of this channel still maintained, not collapsed. But you can see channels try to interact with each other and get closer to each other, right? So from this simulation, we know that these channels have potential to be packed with very high density in lipid membrane. So this is the information we get. 
then we perform the experiment. So we mixed our channel with lip lipids in the detergent solution, and we remo remove the detergent, and they form different aggregates. But when the channel concentration is small, most of aggregates are in the form of small vesicles. When we gradually increase the channel concentration, the vesicle expand, right? The volume, uh, the, the size expand. Finally, it collapsed into flat sheets, right? That's good. So we can make some flat membranes. So we want to know if we can find some ordered structures inside this flat sheet, but it's difficult because it's a softer material. Uh, so we did a cryo TM and then we did a Fourier transform. We find the diffraction, the, the one, two, three, four, five, six, six hexagonal spots. So, so which means these channels are hexagonally packed uh, in this lipid membrane. So, and we're excited. So this is the, the, the simulation model we build. You see the, all the uh, channels packed, like hexagonally packed in the lipid membrane. So, so, so it's good. But we want to do something more. We want to replace our lipid molecules with block polymers. Why? Because lipids are biological molecules. So using block polymers, so they are mechanically and chemically more stable. And more importantly, we can customize the polymer types and the block lengths to f fit the chemicals, uh, chemicals uh, environment of these channels. And we can even functionalize the terminal group so that we can do some surface chemistry in the future. So membrane proteins has been already studied to uh, and maintain its functionality in this block of polymer membrane, such as the proteoredopsin and the alpha helomylysin. They can insert into the polymer bilayer and maintain its original functionalities. And uh, for our group, we use a polybutadiene, polyethylene oxide. Why we use uh, double uh, polybutadiene, double bond, I will, I will tell you later. Uh, but these block of polymers uh, can incorporate the membrane proteins. So we did a, simi a similar experiment. We find that this block of polymer in our channel, they form like nice 2D sheets uh, uh, after the self-assembled studies. But if we take a close look at the morphologies, ah, we find it, the, the, the channels and the, the, the polymer for microphase separation inside this like micro-sized domain-sized uh, membranes. So this is probably because of the channel-channel interaction is different from channel to polymer interaction. That's why it forms like microphase domains. Okay, let's go. I, I was. Can I ask a quick question. Uh -huh. What is the scale bar on this? It, oh, this okay. 500. So this is like 20 to 40 nanometers. So, so anyway, we, we answer the second question. So our artificial channel can be packed with very high density in, in both lipid and the block of polymer mem membranes. So we made something bigger, not just the channel, right? But the, and the, it's like a one micron to one micron size small membrane. But we want to do more, right? We want to re make real, real membranes. So can we make filtration membranes using artificial water channel? This is the, another question I want to ask. So now if we, we take a look at these sheets, these are around one micron to one, one, one micron size, even bigger. But if we take a look at this channel, it has five carboxylic groups on each side. So it's a carboxylic group enriched material. So although it's, it's difficult to depronate it, but it still shows a little acidic uh, properties. So then we can use layer by layer technologies to immobilize these 2D sheets on the surface. So with the help of another uh, poly electrode, the polyethylene amine, PEI. And then this is the original porous membrane we made. It's a PES membrane, polyester siphon ultra filtration membrane. So after layer by layer deposition, I don't know if you look at it, so you can see nice flash sheets covered on the surface. So this is the edge of the like nice flash sheets. So these sheets actually all covered on the surface. So we form the first like, generation of this artificial channel-based uh, membrane. What about performance? So we did a permeability test. This, this membrane casted on the PES, it reached the permeability around the 60 mmH per bar. So if you don't know the, the number, but I can compare it with the commercial membranes. So these two commercial membranes are made from mini pore. The cutoff, molecular cutoff, so it can reject like a 1,000 delta membranes, 1,000 oh, no, 1,000 delta 
uh, molecule membranes. So their permeability is around 5 mmHg per bar. So our permeability is at least one order of magnitude higher than theirs, right? And what about rejections? We test the rejection of our uh, membranes. So this is the control membrane, and this is the PES membrane uh, immobilized like four layer of our uh, 2D materials. It f has around uh, 500 delta in terms of the cutoff. So, so it's, 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 very, it's the similar value to what we get from our molecular transport properties. So our channel is cannot totally reject salt, but it has a cutoff around 500 delta. So this is the molecular properties. Yeah, it's good. But this membrane so is made in aqueous solutions. All these 2D based material, they are, they are made by self-assembly in aqueous solution using detergent. It's not, it not suitable for scaled up. So that's why we want to learn some, something else. So I learned from microelectronics field that these block of polymers can directly self-assemble into different, like, uh, different, sh uh, different uh, microphase separations. So I want to know that can our channels can directly self-assemble in these lamellar structures of these block of polymers. Because our channel majority is hydrophobic, but on the top and the bottom is a little hydrophilic. So maybe we can directly assemble this channel into this block of polymer membrane, and then, uh, then we can put them under pore support. That would be much faster than aqueous self-assembly, right? So what I learned is from, from another group, so we use a like, silicon, clean sil silicon substrate. We add a P dot a PSS layer. So this is a very hydrophilic water-soluble polymers. And then we cast our polymer solutions, spin coat our polymer solution on the surface. It forms a very thin film. The polymer combines our channels and the block of polymers. And then we anneal it, and then we cross-link it. Think about why we use PBP, or that double-double bond will be cross-linked under UV conditions. And then we cut it, and then we take a photo. You can see this is small, but you, you enlarge it, you can see some uh, film, right? This film at, at least will be, I'm good at the photography, but it's difficult for me to focus on this. But when you pick up by a silicon substrate, it's right one inch by inch at least. So we can make some big films made of these channels and uh, these block of polymers. It's a huge progress. And this probably takes like two hours. It's, it's easy to make. So we are trying to test the, the performance of this film in our lab now. So can we do better? Because uh, in the industry, we still don't do make a membrane like this. What do we do in the industry? For the commercial membrane, they're made of two monomers cross-linked at a very high level. For example, the resorcinol and the TMC. The, the OH group will react with uh, acid chloride group within seconds, and they form densely packed, a uh, densely uh, film on the, on the in, uh, interface, right? So let's think about our channels. What, what are our channel made of? Our channel made of this ring structure, and then we extended them into a tubular structure. But their backbone, we can tune the chemistry to OH group, right? And this OH, OH group are very reactive. So we made some experiment. So in our lab, we did something. So we put our TMC in the hexane on the surface. It's not miscible with the aqueous solution at the bottom. So the base, the, the, the aqueous solution, we have channels, this ring structure, not the whole channels, and our resorcinol solutions at the bottoms. And these two solutions, they contact each other. On the interface, you can see the nanofilms. It formed within like one minute. And then we transfer this film onto the substrate. Uh, we can find it will really increase the, increase the flux when we increase the, these channels concentrations. because. So theoretically, what we design is we put this small pore structure into this dense film. So it increased the intrinsic porosity. So it definitely increased the uh, performance. And it also has a good rejection to this 1K and the 0.6K and the 0.3K dye. So it has a better like, uh, rejection performance. Right? So I think this is the current state of our, our, our work. So we try to. Uh, so if we summarize the, my, today's my talk, my talk is artificial water channel-based membrane for desalination. What I do first is I learn from nature. Mangrove trees right, can purify seawater through their root system. So what makes this possible is a different kind of membrane protein. The key membrane protein is biological water channel protein, aquaporins. So aquaporins, so 
because it's not a stable, it's not, uh, it's not, it's very expensive to be used in engineering applications. So we synthesize some artificial structures that mimic cargo porons. So it can transport the water at a very fast level. They are almost similar to aquaporins. So we confirm this value both by experimental method and the simulation method. And then we find that these channels can be packed with very high density in lipid membrane, in polymer membrane. So at the final stage, in the last like half a year, we try to really make some membrane ma materials based from these channel-based molecules. So I think finally, I'd like to thank a lot of people. I'd like to thank my advisor, Manish Kumar. So we grow up together at Penn State, and uh, then a lot of professors, they are my search committee, uh, not search committee, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, thesis committee. And then a lot of professors I collaborate, and, um, and these, these guys are um, from my lab, and they already graduated, they become a doctor. Some are continuing to pursue their PhD, and a lot of collaborators. Professor from whole his group, I learned the synthesis. Professor Mihai also learned the synthesis. And uh, these two groups, Professor Alex from Illinois, Professor uh, Harish from New Hampshire, we did some simulation. And uh, Professor William Flip, we, I learned layer by layer technologies. And uh, from Harvard Medical School, I learned some how to do the cryo TEM with them. So I think I thank, thank everybody's attention for this seminar. I'd like to take any questions. Thanks. <laughs>